race of an entire army. Moving from the pier to the streets, to horse tracks, hospital rooms, to community parks, urban streets to Venice Beach, small churches, individuals of couples of any price gospel, becoming his hands and feet, races open his windows, there to go. This is the power of one. Hello again, I'm Eddie Donnelly. I'm your host of The Power of One. We believe that Jesus and you are always the majority and that Christ in you and you in Christ is the power of one. And we seek to show you each week the raw, the real, and the redemptive. And we're in a great place to do it. We're on location in New Orleans, right here in Jackson Square, in the heart of the French Quarter. Some 11 million people come here every year, spend $7 billion to have a good time, and that's okay. But there's also a, a spirit of evil over this place, and you, right behind me are a group of people doing tarot card readers. And this is right in the very courtyard of Jackson Square, where St. Louis Church, one of the oldest, most beautiful churches in America, exists. There's indeed a place of contrast. A block from here, you can go into a voodoo parlor and buy a curse to curse someone. But a few blocks this way, you can go to the Vu Kari Baptist Church, a most unusual church in a most unusual place, doing an unusual work during an unusual time. Let's watch. Oh yes, the French Quarter, a gathering place for the well-heeled tourist as well as the homeless. The Big Easy, fun and frolic for many, but for others, a search for a place to sleep and perhaps even divine intervention. You have to understand something. When you want God, you can't find him in a meth pipe. You can't find him in a Bible. You gotta find him right inside that door. The Vu Kari Baptist Church meets in a small building that was already a half century old when the Declaration of Independence was signed. But its pastor, Alex Bryan, is new. He and his wife, Annalise, hold church services, Bible studies, and discipleship training like most churches. Yet their local community is, shall we say, a, a bit different. And he not only at first resisted the call to pastor, but arrived at a very difficult time. Basically, every time we moved, uh, every time we made a shift or, or moved, uh, we had considered joining Vukare, and uh, it just never, it never felt right. It never felt like that's where the Lord was leading us. I definitely never wanted to join as the pastor. I just wanted to come and serve. Uh, I have been here since January. So thus far, it's been Mardi Gras in the French Quarter in about two weeks where everyone was sick and then uh, COVID-19 lockdown. So preaching to a computer screen with a sign on the door that says all services canceled indefinitely until about reopening about four weeks ago with masks on and chairs six feet apart. I had a friend ask me uh, who you know was far away and didn't really know anything that was going. He says, well, how's the church going? And I said, well, I've been pastor for two months and already everything is closed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a beautiful church, a wonderful ministry uh, that does uh, compassionate, evangelistic uh, ministry in a way that, honestly, I, I haven't seen very many other places. You know, that's one of the things I think that's so beautiful about the church and about the ministry here is that we are a part of the community. Uh, you know, people know us and, and we know them. Uh, I've been really grateful. You know, this community has a lot of pieces, it has a lot of parts. And what's so unique is the people and then the community that's around us. And so if we're reaching out to our community, it's going to look a little different here than it does elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're not doing we're not doing anything crazy. Uh, it's just it just is a little crazy around here. So
That's a real good guy in the community. He helps us take our showers, he feeds us, and he enlightens us on the Word of God and how to become saved. Well, the church has helped me spiritually, emotionally, and somewhat physically also. To the huge homeless population, the church provides clothes, much needed showers on Fridays, and that also comes with a good hot meal. And on this Sunday, it gave away several dozen new pairs of shoes. On staff to lead the community outreach is Phil Wells, a former touring church musician who spends much of his time walking and talking in the French Quarter, and especially the homeless hangout, Jackson Square. I would have the opportunity to go out and and hang out in the square and just hang out with our folks and actually meet them on their own terms instead of them coming here and uh, meeting us at our house. That's, that's what I always tell them. I always say, I'm coming to your house because you always come to our house. So it's, it's very relational and very practical. Just meeting people on their own terms and um, kind of going with intention of the gospel but it, it's the fine line of being prepared to give an answer and direct conversations to spiritual things and um, not see people as targets because when you get to know homeless folks and people who um, just work with tourists and are around tourists and all that, um, you realize that people just see them as targets. One thing I tell people a lot, like they'll, they'll cover their mouth or, say, or something if they curse or whatever when they're talking about spiritual things. And I'll be like, it's fine. God wants your honesty. And like, that's all he wants. That's all he wants from us. He wants us to keep, you could say, keep falling forward because this side of heaven, we're just going to continue to mess things up. But we have to keep falling forward, keep going forward with other believers and, and keep impacting people for the kingdom. And it's just like, you're a human being, we love you. The rest is just a conversation to be had. Like, you just be honest and you say, I'm a believer, Jesus is real, let's talk about it, let me show you that Jesus is real. And for the pastor who resisted leading the church initially, showing the community the Lord gave him that Jesus is real can be difficult, but also rewarding. Yes, there has been struggles, but for the spiritual benefit, it's, yeah, it's overwhelming. Um, you know, God, God sustains this place and provides for us, and seeing the ways that He's done that even this year, and honestly, especially this year, uh, have been astounding, and uh, just getting to be a part of that uh, has been, uh, has been very rewarding. And seeing, you know, uh, it, in all of my resistance to coming to pastor here, uh, seeing why the Lord called us here and what His plans were for us here um, has been, yeah, just, just taught me because we forget to trust the Lord again. It's just you walk into it with gratitude for the preparation in your life that the Holy Spirit's done that you weren't even aware of. And then now when the fruit of it comes out, you see, oh, that's what that time was for. Hopes and plans include having a denomination-sponsored mobile health clinic visit weekly, and working with the community to provide jobs for the homeless and ex-felons. I recognize that in this church, we, we try to do a lot with very little, uh, but that's, that's really the wrong way of thinking about it, because if we have the Holy Spirit with us, if we have the real presence of Christ here in our body, then there's really nothing else that we need. Uh, there's nothing, nothing that could really provide for us more than, than those things. That is quite a church doing an unusual work, again in an unusual place. God bless them all. You know, I want you to meet a gentleman, Pastor Bill Shanks, who has been arrested over 20 times for protesting outside of abortion clinics. He's a living legend. He's still doing the same things despite all the things that have happened to him. 
He's an icon in the world of the anti-abortion movement here in New Orleans and here in Louisiana. He has a wonderful story. I want you to hear it. You know, the scripture says there's a way that seems right, but it ends in death. This day is that scripture fulfilled in your ears. It seems right to go in because you don't want another baby. But that baby is not yours. The scripture says children of the heritage of the Lord. It says blessed is that they like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Blessed is a man who has a quiver full of them. That little baby that you're going in there to kill may be the baby that would take care of you in your old age. Though many Christian pastors rarely if ever speak against abortion, the Bible clearly sanctifies all life, born and unborn. Reverend Bill Shanks, pastor of the New Covenant Fellowship Church in New Orleans, has been jailed for protesting and blocking entrance to abortion clinics at least 20 times. But there is no doubt he has saved countless lives. And yes, his mission continues. And that's why we're here. We're here to warn you. Scripture says to warn the wicked, lest their blood be upon us. Have we become your enemy because we're telling you the truth? We will help you. We will help you. We will even adopt that little baby and take it if you don't believe that somehow God will help you with it and that. But the answer is never to commit murder and kill your own child. He joined a New Orleans abortion clinic protest in 1987, but he felt awkward. But then he got a call from an Atlanta pastor, as well as one of his local pastor friends, Brother Rod, requesting he go protest in Atlanta. So he called me and uh, he told me what was going on and he told me the same thing. He says, they're putting pastors in jail for trying to save babies. And he said, uh, I want you to come. And I said, um, nothing. I was just thinking. He wants me to go to Atlanta and they're putting pastors in jail there. I'm a pastor and I don't want to go to jail, <laughs> you know. And, um, so we went up to Atlanta and wound up in jail, standing in front of an abortion clinic. The police was on his bullhorn, and he said, he said, uh, you're in violation of this ordinance here. He says, uh, if you don't move, you'll be arrested, you know. So I'm thinking, well, Romans 13 says obey the law and everything, and I'm disobeying this guy. And <laughs> next thing you know, I was laying on the floor in my suit in a paddy wagon, handcuffed. And I never went to jail for nothing before, you know? I said, what is this? And I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, if you continue to do this, he said, this will be the first of many times. We were in jail over there, it was about a week, at the Key Road Prison Farm. It was probably a hundred year old prison, no air condition. They had, uh, you know, screens, they had a big fence outside, but they had screens on the windows and that sort of thing. And we were in there with a number of pastors, and we had communion in there. And this was just with a piece of stale bread and some water, and a roach crawling across the table, you know. But we were in there, no air conditioning, nothing. and. Uh, we felt the presence of God, such a unity, felt the pleasure of God. If you saw a sign on a swimming pool, it says no trespassing, and there's a fence there. You see a little kid drowning in that pool. Are you gonna obey the sign, or are you gonna jump over the fence and go rescue that kid? That was the principle we were operating under, say. Judge for yourselves, whom should we obey? But when you do that, you have to pay the consequences, see? And we were in jail for, you know, uh, so many times, that every time we would do it, and we would block the door to those clinics so nobody could get an abortion. When released from jail, the pastors wound up in court. And I went in there, and there was a black judge sitting up on the bench there. And uh, he asked me, you know, under Scripture says, don't worry about what you're going to say. God will give it to you in the time. Did he ever? I'm sitting in there, and he says, uh, where do you know that pastor from? Because he just got up there and he gave his testimony. He says, where do you know him from? 
I said, sir, I met him in the same cell block you had Martin Luther King in, you know. And he says, what the hell are you got to do with Martin Luther King, you know? He's mad, you know. And I said, sir, Martin Luther King laid down his life for your people. I said, if he wouldn't have done that, you'd be cleaning this court instead of sitting up there judging me, say. And I'm wondering, what the heck was that come out of my mouth, you know? And I saw his eyes get as big as saucers. Next thing you know, his gavel comes down and says, case dismissed. Then they don't have a pursuit of happiness either, see? We all have a right to life, to live. That's given to us by God. He created us. Nobody has a right to take that away. As a matter of fact, God hates hands that shed innocent blood, see? And he tells us that rescue the innocent, that are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand by and let them die. Is God a mandate to the church, see? Don't stand by and let them die. We have been standing by for years and letting these babies die, not doing anything about it, see? We were calling evil good and good evil. We were the evil ones because we were trying to stop it. So it, it just, God burned that in my heart. He hates this. If God hates something, how can I tolerate something that God hates and go on with pastor's anniversaries and pie suppers and growth classes? All those things are wonderful, see? But not when your church is sitting in the shadow of an abortion clinic, see? There should be none of those things in the city. Eh? Each week, he still leads protests outside the city's three abortion clinics, a number that was reduced from 17 in 1980. And in 2014, he led a group on a bus tour to inspire them and celebrate the closed clinics. This place was Uptown Medical Clinic, and there were several doctors. They used to drive in here with bags over their heads get out at that back door. You know, the Word of God says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Well, we were just foolish enough to believe it. And what we did, if it's ours, every place we placed our foot, God's given it to us. So I came out here and set up my barbecue pit. We fed the neighborhood. Some of the people in the clinic came out. I sent my daughter in there, she was pregnant in that, and she said they went crazy. They could smell the hamburger stuff in there. <laughs> but the police set up barricades on both ends of this thing, and what happened? The street was shut down, we brought worship and praise right here, it was awesome. This place shut down, amen, and shortly after that, it was closed for good. Through these doors, many children were killed. This was particularly egregious to God because it used to be a church, and they had turned the church into a place that offers child sacrifice. God was not happy with that. There were four doctors that were in here, and these doctors came out, they cursed us and everything, never did have a sign on, on there, so we tried to help them out by advertising what they were doing. So they came out, cursed us and everything. They didn't want us here, didn't want the signs, didn't want any of this. And we simply told them, hey, Doc, if what you're doing is right, we're advertising for you. If what you're doing is wrong, we're exposing you. And I had a sign made with all four of the doctor's names on it. One by one, they would leave and we'd simply put a red line through their name. Two of them left, red lines through their name. The other guy, he came out, tried to lead him to the Lord. I said, man, you're a young man, you're only 37 years old. I said, you don't want to be doing this. You are going to have to give an account for every baby that was killed. And this guy cursed me out and he went in there. We said, we came to bring you good news. Jesus died on the cross so you could be forgiven for all the babies you killed. Cursed me out, went back in there. Within six months, the guy died. 37 years old. He was eaten up with some sort of infection and killed him. One guy left. His name was Kyat Varnishon. He was a 
Vietnamese guy, and he was a Buddhist. So he came out, says, you have no right to use my name on that sign. I said, listen, I don't want your name on that sign. The day you stop killing children, your name comes off that sign. And man, he just cursed and mocked and everything else. Within eight months, he was dead. We saw a wreath over the place here. I said, maybe they've repented and they're mourning all the little babies they've killed. And the woman came out and she said, look, Dr. Varnish Young died and she said, we're closing up. It's over with. So that shut down this clinic, amen. But their approach produced results. And here we see Jennifer in front of an abortion clinic trying to change the mind of a woman about to enter. And some 17 years ago, Pastor Shanks met her as she was about to walk into an abortion clinic to abort her baby. He convinced her to change her mind. She had her baby, is now a member of his church, and the young man you see praying for the woman about to enter the clinic is that baby, Caleb. And these days, he attends the protest and provides living proof to women about to enter the clinics of the value of having their babies. For all these women that don't know the truth, Lord, I want to pray that, you know, you open their eyes, Lord, and let them realize what they're doing is wrong, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name, Lord. We know it's fruitful. We see God shutting these places down. Well, we didn't shut them down. All we do is go there. And here's the principle we stand upon. Jesus said, upon this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail. Say, now, I take that literally. Say, that is the gates of hell. Gates are protective mechanisms that protect Satan's kingdom. Say. And Jesus said, those gates won't prevail when the church storms those gates. See. So when we show up and we bring worship and praise out there, prayer and intercession, offer help, and those things, before you know it, God shuts that thing down. See. He shut down nine of them here. Is that awesome or what? <laughs> Pastor Shanks believes that when a society condones the taking of the lives of some 60 million babies through abortion, it cheapens the entire nation's value of life. See, bloodshed begets bloodshed. We open the door for that when we say it's all right to kill innocent people. Just don't call them people. But he stresses that anyone who has caused or undergone an abortion can be forgiven. God knows what you did, but he wants you to ask forgiveness for that, see? The blood of Jesus won't cleanse from an abortion, won't cleanse from anything other than sin. And if you justify that, well, I had to do it, or you're not confessing it as sin, therefore you go on with the guilt and shame. But when you tell Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm so sorry I killed that baby you gave me. The Lord says, I know you did that. And that's why I suffered and died on a cross to pay for that, say, I forgive you. His church is starting its own crisis pregnancy center, and it has a history of providing real help to those who decide to have their babies. We can talk to the girl, offer them some help, and uh, we brought, you know, girls home here and just went through the whole nine months with them living here. And we. Oh yeah, we had baby shower for them. When the baby was born, everybody was at the hospital and they decided to keep the baby. Another one, we arranged an adoption for, we're there to put our money where our mouth is, to help these girls. If the church came out there, this would be over tomorrow, say. Just a little scenario here. Let's say the church, whether it's in New Orleans or anywhere else, if only 10% of the people, say 10% of the, the tithe of the church members came out, you would have thousands of people out there. Say. Now it would take maybe a revelation from the pastor. He said, man, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. How can I not do something about something that God hates? We better do this or we will see the judgment of God upon this nation, the likes of which we haven't seen. But I believe we can change this thing. Like I said, all we gotta do is show up and we can change it.
we don't see who we are or the power that God has given us. He calls us to lay down our lives for our brother. He said we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Our neighbor is all those little kids in their mother's womb. Hi, this is St. Louis Cathedral, adjacent to Jackson Square in New Orleans French Quarter. And this is where I was born and raised. I also was baptized at St. Louis Cathedral. And there's a lot of spiritual warfare going out here. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. And no wonder Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Also, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, roams about seeking whom he may devour. So you want to be on guard. And John 10.10 10 states, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to give you more life and give it more abundantly. That's my God. That's my Jesus Christ. That's my Holy Spirit. And be filled with all of them. Those are the ones you want in your spirit, in your soul. God bless. Wonderful works of God going right on right here in New Orleans, Louisiana. Met some wonderful people here, some incredible Christians. And there's an incredible group of Christian churches right here in New Orleans and people doing the work of the Lord in so many facets. But I want you to know for a donation of any amount, and we hope you do, we'll send you a copy of my book autographed any place in America, Ride the White Horse a checker jockey story of racing, rage, and redemption. And right now, this is a wonderful time. The bells are tolling, and they're tolling for you. They're calling you to accept Christ as your Savior, to acknowledge Him as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Chosen One of Israel. So just take a minute to say this prayer with me. O oh, Most Holy God, Forgive me of my sins, Lord Jesus. I know that you are God. I know that you died on the cross so that I can be forgiven. I accept you as Lord and Savior. I accept your forgiveness. Heal me, cleanse me, Lord. Come into my life. Lord, your word says in Jesus you said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So all those who made that decision for Christ, I pray that you give them that abundant life. Be with them, change their hearts, give them peace, give them security, and let them know heaven awaits. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen. See you next week, right here on The Power of One.